welcome all of you uh, to the Vikasat Conversations. Uh, this is uh, jointly presented by the Institute for New Economic Thinking and the Center for Public Policy Research. Um, we are very fortunate to have two great uh, panelists with us. We are very uh, fortunate to have all of you participate today. Uh, before I introduce them uh, for the conversation, uh, just a couple of words uh, to this topic that we are going to be dealing with in the coming hour and a half. Uh, the broad theme uh, is Kerala's response uh, to economic reforms. Uh, within that, of course, there is a focus on development broadly and within that economic growth as well of Kerala. Um, so when we think about that clearly, uh, the immediate issues of managing uh, the fiscal balances, uh, the social side, the environmental side, all of that uh, are very much on our minds, especially as the budget discussions will be taking place. Um, uh, at the same time, Kerala has always drawn the attention of observers, development practitioners, other countries as a state that has stood out in a number of ways, uh, especially it's off the charts when it comes to the usually measured indicators of uh, social progress. So that always gets attention and to the extent which uh, economic uh, uh, reforms are also uh, prompting uh, economic uh, and socioeconomic progress uh, remains uh, a question. Um, so those issues clearly will uh, catch the attention of our speakers today, and we'll have a healthy time to discuss them as well. Uh, the game plan, uh, quite flexible, but the game plan is that the speakers will come in first, uh, and uh, I will uh, pass the discussion on amongst the three of us in the initial stages, and then we'll open up for a broader discussion amongst all of us. <clears throat> so um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Pulapri Balakrishnan, who probably doesn't need a lot of introduction to this group. Uh, he is uh, a renowned uh, economist and uh, policy uh, person who has written on a whole host of issues uh, on India's economy, uh, Kerala's economy, and issues of global interest as well. Um, there are so many things I could mention. His uh, details are in our uh, folders, but let me just uh, um, mention a few that are close to my heart. Uh, one is early on his PhD uh, uh, from Cambridge University. That has a special meaning for me. Uh, then, um, country director for Ukraine, if I, or country uh, lead economist for Ukraine, uh, yes. Uh, that obviously uh, is a very special thing to um, recollect today at uh, this time. And I wonder if you'll make some uh, remark about uh, what, what he carries over from that time uh, as well. Um, the Center for uh, Development Studies, which he led uh, I think in the uh, first few years of the 2010s, uh, that is also of special interest. And uh, uh, we all thank him for the work he did then. And subsequently, um, several books uh, that are of great interest to everyone. Uh, this group might have uh, looked at some of them, Pricing and Inflation in India, Economic Growth uh, in India, uh, uh, et cetera. So um, we couldn't be uh, luckier uh, uh, in having a speaker of his caliber. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, for joining us today. Um, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that very generous introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then we have, uh, we are uh, very, very lucky that Dr. Bornali Bhandari has been able to join us, and she's joining us from Delhi. Um, she's a senior fellow at the NCAER, the renowned institution. Uh, and she has a background in international economics and macroeconomics, um, specifically focusing on the impact of globalization on development. Uh, her current interest, um, especially uh, in terms of working uh, in, uh, at NCAER, is in assessing the progress and prospects of implementing 
direct benefit transfers in states and union territories. You can imagine how critically important this is uh, in improving the social outcomes uh, in the country. And, um, you know, experiment to some extent. Uh, this is a, a great, great value indeed. And she holds a PhD in economics from the University of Oregon. So with the, the two speakers introduced, um, perhaps I can go in that order and invite uh, first Dr. Balakrishnan uh, to um, uh, talk to us, uh, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you, Dr. Balakrishnan. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, uh, for the uh, introduction. And let me uh, start uh, with what I have to say. Um, now, I want to say that a little bit, uh, partly to be argumentative, so that we have something to discuss. From a legal uh, point of view, in a sense, uh, it may not be entirely appropriate uh, to frame this uh, conference in terms of Kerala's response to the economic reforms uh, of 1991, or 30 years of economic reforms, uh, because uh, the reforms were really in areas which are constitutionally uh, outside the purview of the states. Uh, reforms were largely, uh, and what am I referring to? I'm referring to foreign trade, the uh, a reduction of the tariff rate, which was the most important thing, the ending of import controls, uh, on all of which the state had very little to say, or had no constitutional authority whatsoever. Yeah, uh, uh, the other was, of course, also industrial license. So in some ways, you know, Kerala is not particularly obliged to have shown any particular response to the reforms of 1991 or steered its economy within the framework of the reforms of 1991. Uh, instead, um, I think uh, the, it would be entirely appropriate to ask about Kerala's growth and development uh, in terms of the challenges Kerala faces today, which are very, very substantial. And I think we all have a responsibility as economists to be contributing to a discussion on how those challenges uh, can be met and including what those challenges are. Uh, though I have said what I have said about the framework uh, within which this conversation has been situated, I do still believe that the reforms of 1991 uh, have raised issues which are of great relevance to Kerala today. And let me tell you what those two issues are. Those issues are really have to do with the public finances and fiscal policy and also the role of the public sector. Now in 1991, uh, though it was less um, in the forefront than the liberalization of the policy regime in terms of uh, lowering the tariff barrier and abolishing licensing, there was also concern about the fiscal deficit, etc. Now, even if one doesn't necessarily uh, recommend a very narrow uh, uh, fiscal deficit fixated approach of fiscal policy, I would still say that some of the questions raised by the government of India or the reforms of 1991 are hugely relevant for Kerala. And what are they? Uh, this mainly it has to do with the nature of uh, public expenditures and public revenue. And also, their fairness, which uh, is something that one doesn't normally talk about when we talk about public finances, but which is very relevant. And you also see is very relevant in Kerala, interestingly enough, though we tend to think of Kerala as being a, a, a society where policies are entirely fair. We might actually, if we tell be find that there are areas where policies uh, are not very fair uh, in the way they have been conceived and implemented. Now, what is the question here? Let me start with expenditures. And this is really relevant and one of the challenges Kerala faces today, which is have we in Kerala moved a little too fast in targeting our expenditure uh, towards private welfare or private incomes uh, uh, um, in relation to spending on public and I define public goods a little broadly to include health and education. 
And what is the essential question here? The essential question is here is, should we have moved away from spending on health and education to a, a thinly spread pension scheme before we really have an economy which contributes sufficiently uh, to uh, the maintenance of good health and education and care? This is a question that's really, I think, worth asking, and I think it's an important now, the other is a question about revenue. And there is a question, interestingly enough, of fairness here. Now, the public finance uh, um, theorist or economist, is an applied economist, really, uh, Joe Sebastian, has for some time been talking about the fact that the tax revenues in Canada are unduly focused on three areas. One is taxation of lotteries, state-run lotteries, that is. Um, the other is on liquor, and the last is on petrol. And he thinks of this as being a very regressive arrangement. Maybe he pushes the argument a little too much in the context of petrol, but there he's trying to say that petrol is also used by people who are trying to eke out a living, such as auto rickshaw drivers, et cetera. But the general point that some of the taxation may be regressive or the main source of taxation may be regressive because they're focused on goods of consumption of people with lower incomes in Canada. I think it's correct and Sebastian is right to mention that. He's also right and actually, I mean, he has also gone to actually propose an area where taxation could be increased, which is property. And we find that Kerala is, has a large amount of unoccupied luxury housing. Clearly people have high incomes and it's absolutely essential. And many people have more than one house. These are people with a reasonable economic, uh, uh, with reasonable economic heft and they should be taxed. The state government cannot tax incomes under the constitutional arrangements in Kerala, but they could tax property. Of course, technically, uh, property taxes come under local governments, and we come back to that. I'll talk about it maybe in the next round, and there is an issue here. Uh, but property taxes uh, need to be thought about very seriously and could be one small way in which the unfairness of the present regime of taxation in Canada uh, can be addressed. So these are, these are two points about uh, um, fiscal policy and public finances where the reforms of 1991 do have a bearing on Kerala, at least in terms of ideas in, uh, rather than necessarily the specific policy reforms that took place at that, at that time. Now, the other area is uh, with respect to the role of the public sector. Now, um, again, uh, uh, rather like the idea of being overly fixated on fiscal deficit, which I'm not, uh, equally recommending a large scale privatization of the uh, public sector is not something that I recommend for its own sake. It can be ideological uh, in its conception and could have devastating effects as in, as in uh, the creation of the oligarchs in Russia, where uh, at the fall of the, of the Soviet Union privatization in 1991 or after 1991 was conducted in a way that didn't take care of uh, the possibility of monopoly rents, et cetera, et cetera. We just uh, converted, or they just converted uh, public monopolies to private monopolies. So we should beware of, of, of blanket privatization. Having said that, we really, Kerala really needs to scrutinize very carefully what is public sector in terms of the public enterprises is really up to. Uh, in the last budget, the government actually uh, made a provision for the modernization of Kerala's public enterprises. It's not entirely clear to me that after 60 years, the public enterprises should be um, uh, uh, dependent on the budget to actually undertake modernization. Uh, they should generate these surpluses themselves. And I must say that in the 1950s, when the public sector was set up in India, uh, the public sector enterprises did spectacularly, and it's not so well known that the savings in the public sector in India, or the public sector enterprises uh, uh, was marked, grew at a faster rate in the first 15 years after 1950 than the savings of the private corporate sector. To what extent did the public sector in India contribute to the uh, budget in Kerala? I don't know. And I think it's seriously something, or it's something that seriously deserves 
uh, deserves a uh, scrutiny. But Dr. Thomas, do I have about five minutes more in this round? Dr. Thomas, no? Please, yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, please stop me. I don't think I need more than five minutes at this round. All right. All right, now, now, now let me go on to the second of the points which is directly, uh, that I want to make, which is directly related to what the organizers wanted us to speak about, the growth of Kerala uh, after 1991. Yes, it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, the rate of growth of the Kerala economy accelerated after 1991. But interestingly, I personally don't think it is due to the reforms, the economic reforms uh, at the center. I think it had a lot to do with the revival of uh, uh, the Middle East after the so-called Gulf War, where the invasion of Kuwait was uh, reversed, uh, and there was a rebuilding boom uh, in Kuwait in particular and the Middle East in general, and Kerala certainly benefited from that. Benefited from that, and there has been very high economic growth in Kerala. However, it's very important to say not just in this period, but uh, but um, uh, yeah, but more or less in this same period. Growth in Kerala has been extremely uneven. The agricultural sector has not just not done very well. Uh, over the past two decades, work done at the Center for Development Studies at Tiruvannamalai uh, shows that the, uh, uh, in terms of the rate of growth of area output and yields, Kerala agriculture has actually contracted. In terms of yield, uh, it is the, the rate of growth is zero. In terms of area and output, it is negative. Personally, I would worry about this extremely. Uh, this is deeply worrying, and I don't find it having any space in the discourse on the economy of Kerala. And Dr. Thomas had, uh, had said, said that he hoped I would say something about um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, let, let me just say something very briefly here. We are already talking about the consequences of the war in, in Ukraine. Uh, in terms of the uh, likely uh, spike in global commodity prices. This is certainly going to impact Kerala because Kerala is uh, uh, a, a deficit uh, state when it comes to its food consumption. Specific. And I believe very, very seriously uh, that Kerala should pay attention to this. And growth, yes, uh, in answer to the question, there has been faster growth since 1991. I'm not so sure it's due to the reforms. It's really also... Uh, probably uh, more so in terms of uh, remittances, because the industrial sector in Kerala hasn't done particularly well, well after 1991. So, and neither has agriculture. So, uh, and, and services can't really grow on its own. Uh, so, it's very likely due to remittances. Now, at the very same time, I, I would say, while the question has been asked, uh, how has Kerala fared in terms of growth in 1991? We shouldn't only focus on the positive sides of growth. It is becoming apparent that in recent years, growth has also had negative consequences on Kerala. This could, of course, one could say this is actually the nature of growth rather than growth per se. But the fact is that we have reason to believe that the kind of growth that we've had uh, has probably threatened our ecological security. We have been seeing uh, flooding, uh, landslides, uh, clearly, uh, uh, growth has contributed to some extent. It's of course extreme uh, weather uh, weather events uh, uh, or extreme climate events uh, in ter terms of very high rainfall. Uh, but it's also clear that uh, 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 you know unbridled building on a very fragile earth surface of Kerala has probably contributed to a loosening of the topsoil uh, and actually en endangered our uh, prospects very seriously. So I think we should worry about this. And once again, let me tell you, property taxes and land use policies are ways in which we can actually address this issue of, in my view, of gathering of, uh, ecological insecurity in the state. And the last point that I want to make, and I'll end with that, I spoke about Kerala's challenges and let me talk about them. I'll talk about it, I'll try and reduce it to just one issue at this point, and then we'll come back to that and discuss it more. I personally believe that Kerala's challenge really has to do with the fact that uh, almost no line of production in Kerala is competitive anymore. Uh, Kerala is an open economy uh, in terms of it is facing 29 other states in India. Uh, and if it is not competitive in any line of production, 
the only way it can actually supply itself with goods that it needs, if those goods are not produced domestically, food is one of them, uh, high quality industrial goods, uh, industrial goods are the other, the only way Canada can generate the income to make this possible is by the export of labor. We want to think carefully whether we want to remain an economy that exports labor. Uh, <clears throat> there are many instances, and here too, Dr. Thomas himself, uh, Sunanda, so many other Malayalis have gone abroad and done spectacularly well. We wish them, uh, we wish them well, we are very proud of them, but not all migration in Kerala is happily done. Uh, many Malayalis work in many parts of the world, especially the Middle East, under very trying conditions where there's no political rights, no economic rights, and they are uh, they have to face tremendous insecurity, political and economic. So we need to think about providing gender employment here. The only way we can provide employment is if we have production the, here locally, and if the only way we can have production locally is if our production of goods that we are competitive. The final point that I want to make, and I'll stop. And now, uh, in all of this, in uh, generating a, 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 a competitive lines of production in a country, uh, the state or the government has a very, very major role. Uh, the state cannot create competitive advantage, but the state has, or the government has a major role uh, in contributing to it or catalyzing it. It does so by, um, by provision of infrastructure, health and education, that's classic, but it can also do this by nudging um, uh, production in countries to attain global standards. And I just want to say that here also the central government in my view does very little to actually nudge uh, Indian producers to produce global quality goods in a sense that we read about uh, East Asia, especially Korea and Japan, the state having a very major role in ensuring high quality production. Remember in the 1940s, we told by our parents, but by the way, that Japan was the byword for low quality. Anything that came from Japan was low quality uh, compared to what came from Germany and to, to an extent from Britain possibly. Uh, but today, Japanese goods, especially in electronics, motor vehicles, whatever you talk about is that the highest global class. And I'm sure Miti and the uh, Japanese government has had something to do with it. And, and of course, uh, Michael Porter and his diamond model, et cetera, talks about the usual economic factors. But we do have a factor which is peculiar to India, which we, which we are challenged by, and that is regulation. And I think there is a very serious uh, reason to say that a regulation must achieve its ends. It must show, see that the public interest is maintained, but it must not excessively uh, stifle entrepreneurship or production. And I have reason to believe, for re, uh, 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 with, which I will talk about in later rounds, that the government of Kerala has not paid enough attention uh, to, to uh, regulation and has probably left the law bureaucracy of the state to uh, take decisions on matters which it well, probably, not probably, which in my view so, certainly should not be left to it and may, may contribute to a, a less than uh, a healthy. Uh, investment climate in this state. Thank you. I'll stop here for now. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Balakrishnan. I actually want to congratulate uh, Dhanuraj and Sunanda for securing you uh, for this uh, opening comments. Um, it was a tour de force uh, covering really the spectrum of issues that we should be all concerned about. I wouldn't take up time now, but just to reinforce maybe three or four things that you said, um, and come back to a couple of them in the form of questions later. Uh, I think the point about uh, revenue and the narrow focus of taxation, that has to strike us as something to uh, think about. Uh, the expenditure also, I think you linked it even to the aging and pensions. Uh, that has to be a, a matter of great concern. So, you know, how are we spending the uh, government expenditures um, and how does that relate to the well-being of uh, the aging population as well? Uh, the point on agriculture couldn't be more important at this time, productivity of agriculture. And then um, a point that stares us in our face, but the connections or connecting the dots remains extraordinarily weak. That is, 
ecological uh, in, uh, damages are causing floods and storms, at least exacerbating them in a way that we haven't seen in a hundred years. And so if the frequency and intensity of those issues only increase, and according to one or two studies, Kerala is among the most vulnerable and exposed to these events, then all bets are off. All the discussions we have on all other matters will not hold if those uh, turn out to be our Achilles heels. And then finally, uh, not least, uh, the sheer competitiveness picture uh, that will dictate uh, manufacturing, agriculture, as well as services, uh, which is the biggest share of Kerala's um, GDP uh, state uh, product. So with, all, with that, um, I guess I will hold off in posing a question to you, Dr. Balakrishnan, right now. Uh, let's come back to that. Uh, unless you want anything at this stage, I can wait. I can wait, Dr. Thomas. I leave it to you to use your judgment. I can answer you now, but maybe we should listen to Barnali and you can ask both of us questions. How about that? That's, Together. Yeah. that's fine. So it's then my pleasure again uh, to invite Dr. Bhandari to please uh, give us your comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas, and uh, thank you to INET and CBPR for inviting me here. So if you're wondering what my connection to Kerala is, my connection to Kerala is that um, I was part of this team uh, that was led by Dr. Professor Adna Agarwal, and actually that time Dr. Balakrishnan was the director of CDS. Um, so we were uh, in 13 and 14, we were invited by the Kerala State Planning Board to work on a Kerala Perspective Plan 2030. Was was planned to be an eight months process, turned out to be a two year process. And we had we were traveling to Kerala almost once every um, um, alternate month. And not only it wasn't just a secondary data exercise, um, it was actually uh, a very uh, detailed exercise where the government encouraged us and organized interactions, including with students. Um, we had just one whole session with students. Um, and the, so we interacted with all the stakeholders uh, and to get their perspectives in. So that was the learning experience and very interesting experience for me, and that explains the connect, the Kerala connect for me. Um, uh, so from that Kerala perspective, Plan 2030, even though it's a little, day, uh, it's it's been five years since it's been released, it still uh, holds very important um, lessons for us as well as a lesson to Dr. Balakrishnan. Um, and I just want to uh, just point out some of the key messages that um, that we are uh, some of the key analysis uh, and i want to focus on the macro side first and then probably talk about other issues uh, as we go on uh, my other specialties also have worked on skilling and direct benefit transfers well, skilling is another very important issue that i'll come back to and when we have a second uh, point right now i just want to focus on the macro bit so our analysis from the Kerala perspective plan showed that Kerala's economic growth has had three phases, one of economic stagnation between um, 56 to 87, and one of moderated growth phase between 87, 88 to 2012, and one of accelerated growth phase between 45 to 1011. So essentially the growth rate between 2001 and 2011 was 7.4% per annum. Uh, that, that that's a very uh, high significant growth rate. The challenge is that it uh, with, uh, it, it, be, it reached what we call as a middle income. But the challenge that we found that uh, and why the Kerala government at, the, at that time uh, approached or you know requested us that, that there's, a, there's a very high risk that Kerala, or at least the perception was that there was a very high risk that Kerala would fall into a lower middle income trap because uh, the data shows that in 2010. 30 out of the 38 lower middle income countries had been in this group for over 28 years and they could not even acquire the required annual average growth rate of per capita income of 4.7 percent to reach the upper middle income threshold that was the challenge and to overcome that kind of challenge we were invited in um so as i said between 2001 and 2011 kerala grew at 7.4 percent per annum and when we analyzed what were the growth drivers 77% of the total growth between 2001 and 2011 came from five sectors, construction, trade, hotels and restaurants, transport and communication, community services and real estate and ownership. 
all the points, if you think about what Dr. Balakrishnan said, um, are related to that, you know, owning of houses, several houses, sometimes empty, um, service, the large share of the services sector, uh, and not not even in the in the best core and not even the highest productivity ones and uh, uh, so these were all correlated with each other and when we understand within the sectors what were the drivers of growth the drivers of growth were remittances which is about formed about 15 to 20 percent of gsdp tourism which was again nine percent of cross state domestic products and expenditures on welfare and social sectors by both governments and social organizations. So again, if you I'm, I'm sorry, I'm referring to Dr. Balakrishnan, but he, uh, his message is, is, is important. We never, Kerala uh, was spending far more than it was, um, uh, than the, its productive capacity allowed it. And Kerala productivity, productive capacity had not expanded as much. So the idea was to focus on for a productive capacity and how do we ensure that? Um, again, the key growth challenges that were uh, identified in, uh, in this Kerala perspective plan where it was that uh, the Kerala growth was a very consumption driven growth. It, at that point of time, it was the power deficit state. Prior transport to transport, especially road network was relatively small and scarce and expensive land with land acquisition was a major problem. It was strategized at that point of time, suggested that they probably health and education could become a key growth driving um, sectors of the economy as they would take advantage of Kerala's comparative advantage of health and education. Now, the question is that, uh, as I, and I repeat my point here again, that when between 2001 to 2011, uh, Kerala grew at 7.4% per annum, Kerala was that to reach a high middle income um, uh, or high income uh, 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 state, they would have to grow at 7.5% per annum. However, and uh, there's always a but, when we actually look at the statistics between 2011 and 2019-20, the average growth rate of Kerala has been 5.1% per annum. So substantially lower than what was even uh, envisaged in 2011. So uh, if the low, if, if, the, if the challenge of big Kerala being caught in a low middle income trap is very much real for the state. Uh, and not only that, um, uh, where of course 68% is driven by the services sector, 10% is agriculture, the rest is manufacturing. Um, it's a it's a very um, uh, it's it's the, the so so the state of affairs in the macro sense is extremely uh, is quite weak in the state. Um, so we the, another thing what we found is um, uh, NCR does a lot of all India national studies and in the national studies um, uh, one of them we was looked at state investment potential index. Um, it was found that Kerala was one of the top six states for business investment. This was, work was done in um, the 18. And um, not only that, what are the key results? We well, found that 80% of the respondents, that is firms, said that industrial policies was not a challenge. And uh, Kerala had actually uh, improved itself on its land acquisition bits and land pillars. Um, however, they also did not face, 80% of respondents also did not face any problems of road or rail connectivity. They did not face any challenge or challenge of skilled labor, but quality of labor was a problem, but labor relations continue to be a problem in the state. And so what we find is that there has been substantial improvement in the state, but um, despite all this, despite that, uh, despite a very focus in many sectors, what we find is that Kerala has not been um, able to, um, this growth rate has uh, is substantially below, um, below, its, um, below its potential and not only below its potential, below what we've been researched to uh, pull it out to a higher middle income trajectory. It was as low as 2.6% at 2.6% or 2.9% in 1920. This is the pre-pandemic phase. So I can imagine that during the pandemic, Kerala's growth would have come down even further. Of course, as I said, mentioned that the, one of the key drivers of economic growth in Kerala would have been tourism, which drove 9%. Again, one can and one can think through that given that the COVID, given the COVID pandemic, 
given the COVID-19 pandemic, the tourism would have, and we know the tourism have suffered. Our, uh, day, my, some of my colleagues have done analysis for the all India economy, and they find the tourism sector has uh, is is uh, is suffered a lot, and it's going to take them some some time back to get back to the normal. So it it is presume it, it is almost assumed that Kerala the one of the major drivers um, what was affected therefore Kerala's economic growth would also be affected on a negative basis. Uh, rem, uh, so and remittances also would have been affected because. Uh, a lot of uh, the Gulf economies were affected, so that also one of the major drivers would have been affected. So overall, even pre-pandemic, well, there was a slowdown. Kerala grew at a slower rate than the All India growth rate. All India growth rate around this time was around 6.6% or slightly more. And um, and the during the pandemic, all its major growth drivers were affected. So given that, it would have suffered much more um, deeper contraction or deeper negative impact than um, other states, so than other states in the country. So the challenges, um, the, given this, these challenges and given uh, these issues, even though Kerala had been working towards improving its uh, investment potential, it's not showing up in the numbers. And as Dr. Balakrishna has already pointed out, growth has been quite uneven. So the question really is that despite the, uh, that how do we actually, um, uh, make that Kerala uh, or how would we ensure what do we need to do to ensure that Kerala goes to the next level of higher, um, higher income or next income uh, category uh, so it, can, it doesn't get caught in the low middle income trap. So that's where we need to uh, think about um, and that's a sort of uh, that those were my introductory comments. Dr. Thomas it's up to you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandari. So, um, I, I mean, uh, again, uh, you've raised a lot of fascinating points. Uh, I think the uh, discussion of um, Kerala, as you presented, is very much uh, revolving around the growth story, I, I think, and the potential to go well above the low middle income status. Uh, but the real constraints in achieving that I think partly you are saying it is the structure itself that agriculture services and industry seems to lock the state into a very high reliance on service and not enough on manufacturing or industry, uh, but, but also the pattern of uh, investments and spending, the consumption driven type of growth as opposed to something that really raises productivity of the key sectors. And uh, so the natural question would be, uh, and again, we can come back to this in a, in a few minutes. Um, what might be the levers of raising that productivity that you are looking at to uh, lifting Kerala above the level as rapidly as possible? Um, okay, so um, I think if I could raise a couple of questions at this time to each of the speakers, and we also have uh, questions from the chat uh, chat box. So let me uh, mention that. So as you respond, you can also wrap them in. One is something perhaps the speakers have not, uh, because it's so widely talked about, uh, talked that much about, is the uh, performance of Kerala in the uh, SDG sense, uh, social development, and the multi-dimensional poverty. I mean, it stands out in the in the country uh, so so sharply. Kottayam is the only uh, uh, district in the entire country which has no person defined as poor, and that's an extraordinary uh, feat. And so uh, Pradeep asks, uh, "What are the lessons for other, for the others?" And a question for Dr. Balakrishnan: What production activities should be uh, provided by the state? Uh, to give the double-edged sword impacting growth on the one side and comp competitiveness on the other. At the same time, uh, the delicate ecological balance for the state that needs to be addressed. So if I may pose a question to, um, uh, to Dr. Balakrishnan, uh, that would be mine as well. The second one I just mentioned, uh, the ecological and growth uh, axis, uh, are they, uh, confrontational? Are they? Uh, can they be managed together, uh, or do you need to give up uh, some aspiration of the growth 
as we measure it, not the real growth, but as we measure it, GDP, by the way, is an awful measure of performance. Have you ever heard of a measure where you use the gross, not net of damages in measuring improvement? But we are all stuck with that because that's the one thing that is comparable. Uh, but that said, let's say some good measure of progress uh, in terms of income, uh, would that need to uh, be managed pari passu, the ecological uh, Achilles heel of Kerala? So that would be a question to Dr. Balakrishnan, which also picks up a question from Anisha Chitgupi. May I, may I turn to you, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for, for your comments and what I spoke about and this question, yes. Uh, uh, the sad thing is that there are natural limits to growth. I don't think we can get away from that. I mean, uh, but the fact is that we need to, as a people, uh, I say people because it also needs individual contributions by, uh, by citizens and by corporations. Uh, we need to ensure that the growth we have is distributed in such a way uh, that those at the bottom of the pyramid are, uh, do not have to sacrifice as much or at all in relation to the those at the top of the pyramid. Now, uh, why shouldn't some growth uh, uh, in the form of very expensive luxury housing be sacrificed? for ecological security. I don't think that would be such a big sacrifice to have. Uh, on the other hand, let me just, let me mention to you a lot of uh, ecological degradation uh, and ecological decline, even when it's not degradation, actually goes against the economic activity and growth. Uh, as we uh, overuse the water supply, there's less available for paddy cultivation. As there is less paddy cultivation in the state, there is less employment generated in the form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the form of tasks to be performed. So there are many areas in which, where if we uh, pursue ecologically mindful practices, not allowing for ecological decline, uh, 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 even when it's not ecological degradation, uh, we can actually. Uh, uh, you know, take care of, it, of both uh, uh, growth of incomes and preservation of the environment, or actually improvement in our ecological condition. Let me tell you, that, on the other hand, there are, I mean, e e ecological degradation can also lower uh, employment uh, and, and therefore uh, uh, well-being of the population. Let me give you a small example. There's an example of uh, a member of a global uh, travel and tourism body, uh, having been invited to Kerala to actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, experience his scenic beauty and ride back what a lovely place it is. I believe uh, that he decided midway on the taxi journey from Trivandrum Airport to Trivandrum uh, town that he had had enough of it uh, and he was going back because he saw so much of garbage actually piled up on the roadside. So the point is that ecological degradation can also affect our income earning capacity. So it is not as if, uh, you know, mindfulness of the environment is necessarily anti-growth. It does not have to be. But having said that, I do believe that there are ecological limits to uh, the scale of economic activity. And we, we may all have to uh, think a little more uh, carefully about uh, expanding roads everywhere. We just may have to, uh, like as in Singapore, uh, tax uh, road use much more stringently, uh, tax the uh, ownership of vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. Because what we're seeing today, uh, the expansion of road networks in Kerala is actually destroying our paddy fields. And once again, I'm coming back to the issue of, of food security. I, I, and therefore our, our, our well-being. So I've spoken for a while. I'm not sure if I, I should carry on on this. Uh, I just wanted to mention something about poverty, the point that was raised from the floor uh, about Kerala, Niti Aayog's uh, uh, index of poverty showing Kerala has almost zero poverty for the state as a whole. I mean, 
a quarter district has zero, and the state as a whole had points, uh, 0 0.7 or something, which is really quite remarkable. But I just want to point out to you also, Kerala has very high unemployment. And the only way unemployment can be tackled uh, is by having more economic activity and more production here. So the competitiveness issue is fundamental. And, and we need to worry about that. There's a point from uh, uh, Bernali's presentation, which is very well made. And I want to emphasize that I'm going to say uh, 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 with this point and something which comes up as a result of that, I will stop. Um, uh, the point is that labor relations are an issue. Uh, it is important for the state government to see itself as an agent for bringing about smooth and cordial labor relations uh, in the state. Otherwise, you just will not have the kind of work practices or capital investment necessary to raise labor productivity and therefore our uh, material standards of living in the long run. Dr. Thomas had asked to raise this space of water to raise productivity. Uh, and the government has a major role in that by bringing about more congenial uh, labor relations. I just, I, I did mention about the regulatory apparatus, which has nothing to do with either unions, labor unions as we understand them, or corporations or companies. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I must bring up a, a controversial issue, but I think it's relevant for me to make the point. Uh, we all read about uh, a, a Kerala industrialist taking out uh, investment of over a thousand crores, which he had pledged to uh, invest in Kerala because he made a public statement, which is very brave of him, that he has been harassed by the regulatory uh, machinery. And I think that is something we should worry about seriously. Uh, in Kerala, the importance or the seriousness with which we treat political rights uh, does not seem to extend to creators of, of jobs and creators of wealth. But we must realize that so long as we live in a market economy, uh, the creation of wealth is very important and the private sector is important. The private sector should not be left unregulated, but the regulation by the bureaucracy must also be accountable. You cannot have un, uh, un, an ungoverned bureaucracy. So with these uh, with these uh, comments, I will stop here. And uh, yeah, over to you. Okay, uh, thank, you for, thank you for those remarks. Uh, I wanted to come back to you in a very, in a very short order uh, to some follow-ups to what uh, you have uh, talked about both in terms of the questions from the audience and my own thinking. Uh, but let me uh, take a minute to go back to Bornali. Uh, there are questions uh, as well to you, which uh, I can wrap into my uh, question as well. Uh, I think it's very interesting that you have a vision or a projection of what, what the state could be in a steady state growth path uh, to from which it's uh, uh, diverging for a number of reasons. And that's a nice framework. Within that, I don't know if your report or your own current research points to one or two critical pieces in the type of growth Kerala is pursuing that's not allowing it to snap out of the low middle income trap. Now, relating to that, one of the questions uh, is uh, from um, Anand, uh, whether the examples of other countries sheds any light on how they have avoided that trap. We hear a lot about the middle income trap, but the low middle income trap wasn't as prominent because you do get through to the middle income stage and then you could get stuck. But nevertheless, and if they have avoided it, how have they and who is stuck in that uh, situation? So let me just um, leave it kind of open for you to come back uh, to. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, I think the, in, the important thing, what we uh, sort of, at least in that Kerala perspective plan 2030, what we had mentioned was that we need to, what we did a very detailed analysis and I, I tried to identify what are our comparative advantage or what Kerala could produce at a lower cost than compared to other states. And what we found is that where and there and we were not just looking at just pure growth, but in a green growth kind of phenomena. And uh, what we found is that that uh, you know that you could have the health and education sectors where Kerala actually has a comparative advantage and where it tends to perform well, both in terms of in terms of development outcomes, could be turned into an engine of growth. So 
what we tried to say was our strategy was that every sector like if whether it be in health sector the medical tourism could be it could be connected to the tourism sector and health tourism could be an engine of growth then uh, even education tourism where we students study and therefore um, they stay in university towns could this that self be translated into an avenue of growth. So we thought of, um, and of course, every uh, you have to, one of the challenges that we uh, realized in terms of ecology was that Kerala didn't have any air pollution, but its water pollution was quite high. So how to preserve the water and how to grow in a green, sustainable way was very important. But I, I think in our focus in Kerala, we sometimes we forget, um, and I here I want to emphasize that Kerala is not just, it's a part of India. And the fact of the matter is when you look, and I wanted to mention in the beginning, actually, and, uh, I just want to mention here again, that the, even, even though the Kerala has grown at a slower rate than all India average, but even if you look at the Indian trend, even the India trend has been slowing down uh, from 1617 to 2021. It uh, fell down significantly in those years. And uh, I'm not talking about the pandemic, even pre-pandemic, there was a major slowdown between 16, 17, and 1920. And uh, this is well captured now and well analyzed. So, and so if if the all India was slowing down, it is but natural that Kerala would be slowing down too. It's, it's uh, but uh, but the where the concern is that it is slowing down even at a lower rate than the rest than than the all India average. Um, uh, yes, we talk, we can to find about finding comparative advantages. That is one another story. We have, I think, where the challenge for me uh, in the work, in the follow up work that we find, find is that Kerala is not able to find an engine of economic growth. Every, like, when um, I was trying to forecast uh, or understand the impact of the pandemic on, the, on all over India, and we were trying to find out which which sector, which states will be the most affected. And we could, you could simply look at it at Gujarat and Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu contribute a significant lot to the manufacturing sector. So if COVID pandemic uh, hit those states in a more significant manner, they're all India um, and they would be, they would be closed down in a more significant manner. Therefore, um, all India would also be, um, would also be hurt. But it, in in case of Kerala, it just did not come up anywhere as as uh, as contributing a significant share to economic growth in any subsector. At least it didn't stand out. I'm not saying it does not contribute. Of course it does, but it's not a significant share. So what needs to be done um, is that we need to find a, not one but a couple of engines of economic growth, green growth. I'm not talking about non-green growth. A green growth. Which, which takes care of its advantage of uh, advantages of Kerala and turns that around into uh, into a growth pressure. And I think the COVID pandemic per se is a huge opportunity and a huge challenge for us that uh, that way, a huge opportunity for us because it really forces you to think through that what were our what you know what did survive the pandemic and what um, what uh, what were we despite the pandemic what sectors uh, we were not we were able to overcome the one of the things i remember was in tiruvanthapuram um, that there is a uh, near the software part of thing it there was a entrepreneurship hub and kerala is doing very good very well on uh, entrepreneurship so i think if entrepreneurship is the way out that's one aspect we could do and you know again where investment potential becomes very important that we could create an environment of um, of uh, where, where there are more entrepreneurship abilities and entrepreneurship opportunities are built in given kerala's very high education and high attainment of education and health and very highly presence of very highly skilled people I think it becomes very imperative that uh, we could create growth potential. The idea is not that you cater in today's world. It's not cater, what you cater to Kerala. You it's, you're catering to pretty much the rest of the world. The idea is to okay, what are the growth engines that Kerala can leverage on or uh, use as competitive advantage to create that uh, capacity? Because more productive capacity means more employment. And Kerala has a higher, higher, relatively high sh uh, share of unemployment. But I think I was when I was looking at the statistics, 
again um, from nine, for 1920, the periodic labor force statistics. What we find is that the youth unemployment rate is also very high in Kerala, uh, especially among the educated. So educated unemployment is very high. And uh, this is the question is, why are educated, what are the aspirations of the educated uh, youth or educated people that they are not able to find jobs in Kerala? Either you're not, so there's a mismatch. If there's a mismatch, that means you're producing jobs in the lower end. That means there's, there, and we know that that is met by migration from the uh, from other parts of the country. So then, um, so therefore, we and what so India so Kerala in a way is caught in a very low equilibrium trap, where for the for the jobs that you're producing, you're um, attracting migration, a lower skill labor force to meet your current labor needs. And uh, you're out migrating the higher skilled labor force to meet the demand, whether internally or externally, out of the country or within within the country. So the point the point is that we have we have invested so much in our education and health. How do we leverage them, or how do we create jobs for those educate highly skilled or educated people? Um, to uh, how do we do that, and uh, so how do we leverage that? those comparative advantages that Kerala has created. And that I think that's where the challenge for Kerala is um, uh, uh, to think about. And I think private sector, uh, in this case, the, the role of private sector becomes a very, very important. The role of the government is to enable, create a, uh, a, create a framework, create the enabling factors so that this private sector can take off. But uh, just, uh, just purely, using the government to create jobs may not be the answer that uh, we are looking at but again the the pandemic um and just and just to put things in perspective we have uh, i also do the macro forecasting for the indian economy or i used to and last year when i was doing this exercise um we found that if um if there had there had been no uh, if india had grown um without if, if if india if it will take india almost 10 years to catch up with what india would have been growing at uh, if there was no pandemic so even with uh, with all growth rates better 9.2 percent 8.9 percent it does not matter it would still take india 10 years to catch up with the counterfactual that is uh, the growth if india had not been growing uh, if india if the covid 19 pandemic had not happened so the severity of the pandemic um, cannot be undermined. And again, uh, so the, the the what we need to think is that these what are the opportunities that have been thrown to us, and how can we think of a how can we leverage a comparative advantage for a green sustainable growth? Um, and I end my uh, Dr. Thomas off to okay. you. Again. Okay, thank you very much for that detailed explanation, which has generated follow up questions. But I'll come back to that. Um, uh, let me <laughs> let me let me mention a couple of things uh, that either Dr. Balakrishnan or Dr. Bhandari could uh, pick up. Um, kind of connecting what also some of the uh, commentators uh, from the audience have mentioned. Um, the poverty numbers. Uh, of Kerala, extraordinary. Uh, outside observers uh, are fascinated by that. But how real are they? Are they in line with the research in Kerala does, what Niti Ayog does as well? Uh, or, or, or is it uh, uh, different, especially when unemployment rate is some 9% plus, uh, which compares, contrasts with India's 6% average? Uh, so that, that's one kind of family of questions. I mean, that's a whole whole issue, but either of you might pick that up. Uh, but related to that, also uh, the, the dilemma or the puzzle of the COVID story, standout performance of the state, and then it looks like the sky started falling. Uh, how do you reconcile that? Uh, you know, uh, life expectancy is very high, which is the, which is the goal of a lot of development literature. So how could you argue with that? But the aged population are also very vulnerable. Uh, is that going on? And what about the numbers? Is it testing? But I guess related to today's discussion, it would be more about the nature of growth and stability in Kerala relating to human development and poverty. So maybe I can wrap that 
into that as well. Uh, the poverty numbers, the COVID numbers, um, and um, you know the the the, uh, the related to that, Nissi has a question, uh, and I think some of the people are also thinking the same about the comparison or contrast of Kerala with Maharashtra and Gujarat uh, on growth rates. The latter fares strongly in uh, relative comparison. How about social, uh, human? development, no. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, so is there a trade-off there or um, or do you see something that can be more complementary, like uh, Dr. Balakrishnan mentioned in the case of ecology, uh, that was a heartwarming message that you could do the two together, but it's not automatic. And then back to Dr. Bhandari's last set of comments, uh, the, the, there is a question whether the you know, high share of services in Kerala, is that per se a problem? Is there a set recipe that manufacturing and industry has to be a certain percentage? If you look around East Asia and others, uh, probably not, but uh, you know, in, in, in fact, your comments also say that you need to you know, invest wisely in health, education, et cetera, as well. So I don't see that as a contradiction. I don't know if you want to say anything more, but I would say, Investing in those well is part of the productivity racing perform, uh, story. So it's not so much what's the share and therefore it's a problem, but it's more what does it represent in terms of productivity. And I think you know Dr. Bandari would probably agree with that too, that I don't see an, a necessary contradiction, but nevertheless, it's good to point out. I mean, if you think if we think services are you know, showing a very high share. How come you're still rec recommending more investments in services? It's not quite that, it's about doing it better going forward. But anyway, um, may I just leave it to your judgment on how to take up something, uh, Dr. Bhalakrishna? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, when you, you put out so many questions, I'm not sure we'll be able to answer them in a, or even uh, engage with them in a very effective way. Uh, but I just thought I should first try and engage a question uh, asked on the floor, which you raised yourself about Kerala, Maharashtra, Gujarat. Uh, I want to say first, and here Dr. Kebernali can actually uh, help me. Um, am I not right that during some phase, some relatively recent phase, of course before 2011 or certainly before the pandemic, uh, Kerala, uh, Kerala, I don't look at these numbers, so I don't know about this carefully, but this was actually made by, by Sen as a vindication of his observation about Kerala made about 30 years ago. Wasn't there some phase when Kerala was one of the fastest growing economies in the state, in the country? Am I not right? Yes, yes. Between 2001 uh, and 2011, Kerala was growing at 7.4%, which was yeah, quite... 2000, 2002 and 2011, is it? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So that's the first thing. I mean, I, I don't want to, um, to turn the whole discussion about any economy, in this case, economy of Kerala, completely on rates of growth. But in answer to the question which was actually sent to me in the chat box, yes, there could be phases when Maharashtra and, and Gujarat grew faster than Kerala. But there was a longish period of almost a decade when Kerala grew. Uh, it was one of the fastest growing economies in the uh, states in the country. Not that it, it, it affects me one way or the other, but I just want to uh, place that as perspective. And I just also want to say something since uh, 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 Dr. Bernali has told us about the phase of acceleration of the rate of growth of Kerala uh, and link it up with the overall theme of the, uh, of the conversation. Uh, it's kind of interesting uh, if you look, think about it carefully, uh, the uh, economy itself began to grow faster only from 2003, right? But not only by, uh, being from the NCR, you know this, but it, things didn't happen automatically after 1991. Let me tell you very clearly. It took more than a decade for India to accelerate. And at that point in time, of course, it, it grew at a very fast rate, 2003 to 2008. Uh, it, uh, it, it was the fastest growing phase of India ever. And just to teach politicians a lesson, the rate of growth uh, actually uh, I wouldn't say equally distributed, but the acceleration occurred in the last phase of the Vajpayee government and continued uh, during UPA one. So it is not uh, exclusively the, uh, the preserve of any particular political party. But I just want to say, so Kerala's growth is actually 
not so bad. That's all that I want to say. I don't want to come into this. I don't look at these numbers very carefully. But that's my response with Q&A. And as Dr. Um, um, Thomas, he, of course, raised it as a query, I can confirm this because I'm working on this. Uh, on every major social indicator and also per capita GDP, which surprised me, I must say, not per capita consumption, per capita GDP, numbers from ET, IOG, uh, SDG indicators, which is just released, 2022, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Kerala is higher per capita GDP than uh, Gujarat. Please, uh, one of these bright sparks who's sending in these questions, please check that. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm too old to do that now, so please uh, help me by checking that out for me. So I just want to say on growth, it's not as if Kerala is doing very badly relative to the country. But I would focus, and so, but you know, focusing on how much is the rate of growth in this state and the other state, I want to ask this question, could there be potential downside to the kind of growth that we have in Kerala? Is, is there some unevenness of growth that we should be confirmed with? Concerned with, and is there something in this growth pattern which is inequality generated? Uh, Kerala's consumption inequality. Uh, we don't have any income inequality data for their states. Consumption inequality from NSO, NSS, excuse me, uh, shows Kerala to be the state with the highest consumption inequality in India. Uh, so, in general, we should be asking questions about the growth beyond the growth rate. And I just want to say. Uh, yeah, and about Gujarat and Maharashtra, in particular, about I, I mentioned about Gujarat's uh, per capita GDP. Maharashtra, about Dr. Um, Thomas said correctly, uh, early days, Canada was being written about from everywhere, from the Guardian to the Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera. And then the roof seems to have fallen off about a year ago, or six to nine months ago, when uh, the, the death rate was very high in Canada. I just want to point, uh, point out to one thing, though. Uh, the death rate that is the, the measured death rate in Kerala is probably a little closer to the actual than the measured death rate in other states. I mean, Dr. Thomas is based on poverty numbers. I'm not in a position to answer that. And he's also raised a very important question. Does unemployment figure in the multidimensional poverty index? I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, that, that's a little task for me. I will be going out and checking that. And if unemployment figures, maybe Kerala will not do all that well. I suspect it does not care. So that's a, a kind of by way of some responses to. Now, uh, there's a response, uh, sorry, there's a question from um, uh, Ms. Anisha Chidgupi, which I didn't reply to, uh, where she asks about specific um, lines of production where Kerala could grow faster. Before coming to lines of production, I just want to say two things. Uh, there is no magic bullet. It's clear that the state must act on several fronts at the same time. Uh, but I want to make a general point, and it's more in the nature of a query. Uh, has Kerala uh, a privileged distribution over production? I don't know. It's a question we should seriously ask. And in the long run, uh, it cannot be uh, a, a wise policy to ignore production uh, while actually emphasize so much of the economic policy being focused on distribution. I use the word distribution uh, consciously. I am not certain uh, whether I, I, I would agree with the CPPR's concept note using the expression redistribute to welfare state. Where is the redistribution in Canada? Are the rich being taxed at all? Uh, should I be given a subsidy on my electricity consumption? I'm scandalized. There's no way I can pay my bill and pay the subsidy, which is mentioned in my bill, by the way, which is mentioned. It's something quite embarrassing that it should be mentioned purely because I live in a rural area. Anyway, the distinction between rural and urban in Kerala is, is, uh, uh, is very uh, narrow. I mean, uh, the former finance minister, Thomas Isaac, who I, I was privileged to con Count as my colleague at some time, uh, coined the expression gragaram, as in gramam and nagar. <laughs> yeah, that is the kind of pattern of settlement in Kerala. You cannot make a distinction between urban and rural settlement. So, why should I be given a subsidy because I live in a rural area? Uh, now, why should I be given a subsidy when the, the Kerala State Electricity Board cannot generate electricity of a steady voltage throughout the day? 
And this is not just some aesthetic concern. My, the, the capacitor on my pump burns out. Uh, my equipment is ruined. Uh, and and would, it, would industry be careful about, I mean, would be casual about setting up production when these services, which can only be provided by the state, are unreliable? So this is a point about the magic bullet. I'll, I'll, I'll conclude very soon. Uh, I've made several points, but both, there were phases when growth, uh, Kerala grew, uh, grew as fast as uh, any other state in India. So don't overdo these comparisons. In any case, these comparisons are not necessarily good. The, uh, the scenes that we saw from Bombay during the height of the pandemic are just you know, disturbing. And I would say that nothing comparable has happened in Kerala. And that is certainly some testimony to the government system. And in particular, where the uh, government system has worked very well is in the rollout of the vaccination. It's actually extremely impressive how this was done in Kerala. You didn't have to jockey for position or jostle. You got, got your uh, um, you, you got your jab in time, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So with this, I will finish. Uh, and I just want to say, yeah. Uh, now there's a question in chat box: Which countries should Kerala learn lessons from? Sure, we should learn lessons from many countries. Uh, uh, the many years ago, Jeff Sachs uh, visited Kerala, and he said, uh, "You should compare yourself with Malaysia. It's a country on the same latitude." Uh, it's a country which has, has a high presence of the agricultural sector. Uh, you should compare your per capita income uh, <laughs> with what Malaysia says. So then we could learn a little bit from the rest of the uh, world, there's no doubt. But we can also learn from other states in India. And there is no doubt it may have higher poverty and, and lower, uh, lower um, uh, or poorer social indicators than, than Kerala. But Tamil Nadu has done one thing right. Tamil Nadu has a given production in this state the due um, recognition that it deserves, which is why um, uh, people from Tamil Nadu probably have to migrate to a lesser extent than people from Kerala. And I think therefore we have a lot to learn uh, from the, the, the rest of the country too. Uh, um, you know, um, so uh, other countries, yes, but. Uh, we have a lot to learn from the other states in India also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Bornali, would you like to pick up that last thread on um, uh, the investments in services or social sectors, et cetera? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, I just want to add uh, two points here. Um, I'll, I'll add to the thread. I just want to extend, um, emphasize on what Dr. Balakrishnan said. I don't think I think in this comparisons are good to learn from, but I think we have to understand, look at the individual economic history of the state and uh, how it has developed, look at its own individual resources and look at it that carefully. I mean, we, we, but even while we go into a state, um, you know, it's 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 not a copy and paste. Let's do what Maharashtra has done and paste it into Kerala and Kerala will grow. It doesn't work like that. You have to understand the context, you have to understand the resources, you have to understand the history, and then uh, recommend or suggest a growth path and see if there's a buy-in uh, also. So it's, a, it's an interactive process and sensible process. If you just impose something, it's not going to work. Uh, so that's something. And the a second point I do want to add here is that Kerala is a part of India, like any state is a part of India. Yes, at a particular point of time, somebody, someone's growth may be higher or lower, that's true. But the thing is you have to follow the trend and that's why I mentioned the All India trend. The All India trend, then um, that's uh, where, uh, uh, as, uh, since I do macro, I sleep and read these numbers. But between four, five and 11, 12, we were growing at a very fast rate. Since 11, 12, that is a great financial recession. India has seen very high business uncert uncertainty. Growth has varied, it has gone up and down. And uh, and then, as I said, from 1670 to 1920, we have seen a very significant uh, trending downwards of GDP growth. Kerala has followed the same pattern until 2001 to 11, sees very high rate of growth. And then uh, post 11, 12, we see a slowdown. So it's it's not that Kerala is not part of the Indian story. I think in, in a way, we are asking ourselves, it's in a way is, okay, uh, how do we, um, you know, push the Indian story? Story because Kerala's story is intertwined with that story. 
Um, and, and I think that's that. And also, in a way, the third point I want to say, Kerala is ahead of all of us, right? All of other states, both demographically, both uh, SDGs uh, wise in terms of health and education. It, it's a leader for the rest of the remaining states of India. And uh, any state would like to replicate that uh, at any point of time. I think that's one thing we have to understand that and respect that. The challenge is, is not about a challenge is about a mismatch. Are we we have skilled people, we have educated people, but are we creating jobs for those people? I think that is where the challenge is. This mismatch between our resources, and that actually brings me down to the point the last thread as Dr. Thomas was pointing out and he, he, he answered the question but services sector is not just one homogeneous sector right as I mentioned in my first point that services sector is 77 percent of total growth between 2001 and 11 was driven by construction trade hotels and restaurants transport and communication communication community services and real estate ownership now, trade hotels and restaurants typically don't always hire, I'm not talking about the five star hotels, but trade hotels and restaurants don't typically always hire the most highly skilled people. You don't even need to be classed to work in your local uh, dhaba. I'm using, sorry, I'm using a Hindi word here, but uh, the local uh, store. So you don't need fancy uh, schooling to work in a local um, food place. So, yes. Trade and hotels and restaurants contributes, but when you look at the productivity in that subsector, it is very low. And due to the nature of the pandemic, contact intensive services like trade and hotels and ownership suffered a lot. So it's not just about which subsector, it is about the productivity in that subsector. And we have shown that, and it's it's documented for all India also that it's a it, these are we are this sector is important. It even it employs a lot of people, but it's not employing. Uh, the highly skilled people that um, Kerala is producing. The which sectors do uh, um, uh, employ the highly skilled people? It's the uh, IT, the finance, the health, the education sectors, where you need professors, we need, need trained personnel, you need a care economy, you need good nurses, uh, you need good um, trained. So, you know, what can we do? To, uh, to create jobs for the highly skilled people that Kerala is producing is the challenge. How do we match that better is, is, is the challenge here. Um, it's not unique to Kerala, it's for the rest of India also, you know. So, um, and we all know, we all go where the job is, right? So, um, so in that particular case, I think this mismatch. So when I'm talking about service sector, not necessarily contradicting myself, I'm just saying we need to go from move from low value added activities to higher value added activities, and uh, and how do we find how do we find those value added activities within the services sector? We need to move away from transport, hotel, and communication. It is important. Let it be there, but we need to move to higher value added activities like health and education, which are again these are we have identified based on the analysis. This may have changed also in the last couple of years. But based on the analysis at that point of time, uh, it's suggested that India uh, that Kerala has a uh, is resource and uh, more has more resources on these areas. Uh, it is of course is the uh, the heart of Ayurveda. So Ayurveda tourism, uh, Ayurveda and tourism, if they could be linked, could be made more sustainable. Education institutions could be made more sustainable. There is a lot of thought process that's going on even in, even in the all India basis now. Uh, many uh, the government uh, of India is encouraging that um, private uh, that uh, international colleges and universities open up um, in uh, in uh, campuses with, within India. So there are um, just I mean all these small private universities which open up in a smaller place have a multiplier impact on the local economy of the city, and these people are not just fly operations right because you will stay there you will spend at least three years of your graduation maybe five years of your phd in that place you will be staying which means rents go up if you mean be spending money which means it creates a multiplier impact in the local economy and creates a much more sustainable uh, environment so that's the kind of things 
Uh, I'm not saying, I'm just giving you an example here, but uh, of course there are many more examples can be built in. But it, uh, it has a multi, the idea is it is a multiplier impact on the economy and increases the productive capacity of the economy. Obviously these places would be urban, right? So that all the urban um, environment would have been created. That was the idea with which we went in, um, which, which we thought would make sense for, uh, for this thing. One of the things that, um, I remember uh, looking at it because it was my idea. <laughs> uh, was that you know, like Kerala has a lot of wetlands, and we were one of the things at that point of time Kerala had not thought of using that as a tourism spot. I mean, you can do, you can have green tourism, eco tourism, where you encourage, uh, support sustainable tourism at the same time using that to create again a productive capacity. So I think one another thing was we looked at even traditional sectors of Kerala like coir and bamboo and everything else. Um, and uh, bamboo is something I've, I've done other work during my skilling work. I've visited Tripura and it's, you know, it's it was fantastic to see the effort that is going on both in Kerala and Tripura in terms of bamboo. but. Are we close to even what China is? No, we aren't. We are not even capturing the market that China has created, both in terms of the share of the market, in terms of designs, in terms of uh, anything else. We're just not there. So we have to, again, we think of bamboo as a local resource and how can we leverage that art resource and really then aim for the stars and get there. I think that's, we, we really have to think a change, uh, bring about a change in the way we are thinking. Sorry if I'm, I'm going away, uh, not a little passionate about it. So on that note, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's sorry. fascinating. Uh, we could um, have continued this for another hour easily. Um, so uh, Dhanuraj and Sunanda, we are getting close to our uh, appointed time, but there's still some uh, important questions that I haven't been able to put on the table, uh, but we, we, we can stop in seven minutes if I could just take a second to thank for the tremendous organization and the panel now, because I think I'll run out of time to express my thanks at the end. But quickly going back, um, on, on the poverty, uh, there are questions raised rightly, and uh, equally, uh, I think uh, Dr. Balakrishnan had flagged the inequality or the income differences. And um, Kerala does rank poorly, very poorly on that. It, it should surprise everyone with all the social investments. How come the Gini coefficient is uh, on the wrong side of the ledger? So that, that's kind of one, one question. Maybe I just leave it at that. But then uh, specifically, uh, Arun had asked about, uh, this is to Dr. Balakrishnan, can the state with such fiscal difficulties uh, afford the silver line? Um, that is one. Um, and I think, uh, Bonali, it was very good that you flagged the productivity of high value adding services uh, uh, as, as, as a direction uh, which is consistent with uh, you know, increasing good growth. Uh, then there was a question also, uh, these are different buckets, so I hope at the end you know, it's okay to see different areas covered. One is what happened, you know, Keltron, number one early in the game, Cochin Containers, EPZ, export processing zone, early in the game. Uh, since then, what happened? What, you know, why didn't Kerala keep the lead in those areas? Uh, Murali Tharan was asking that. And then, um, yeah, uh, back to Dr. Balakrishnan, Shivarani asked, uh, asks, uh, well, given the fragility, which I think we all take to heart as a, reality, are there some industries that are better suited uh, for Kerala? Uh, and then finally, Juan, um, yeah, uh, land sales and purchases left, right, and center, center. is it part of why uh, lower producer incomes and, uh, and the, the, the agony of the agricultural sector persists? So I'm uh, sorry, it's not highly organized, but maybe you could kindly take a couple of minutes each to say whatever you like on those or any other questions you, you, you want. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas. I'll try and uh, answer uh, all of these very, very briefly because uh, for one, I, I just want to say, uh, uh, it is not correct to say that la agricultural land is 
uh, except maybe in the estates are owned by companies. Agricultural land in Kerala is owned by small producers, and that is the problem. They're too small for the family to actually earn enough, even if they're highly productive. But here, the state in Kerala has not been imaginable to, at all in allowing for leasing of agricultural land. The leasing of agricultural land, especially of paddy, is extremely complicated. Nobody knows the rules, and it's absolutely essential that we should allow it, uh, and the state should back the leasing of land. So let me move on to the point about Shib um, uh, Shibarani. Uh, there are certainly industries, industries in which Kerala was actually ahead. Uh, the industries would be textiles. In fact, the word calico is is a kind of pigeon Malayalam for Chalian. Chalian being people who actually produce the cotton, uh, which uh, the Portuguese converted to calico. Uh, and the uh, term name Calicut is believed to come there, come from there, uh, which was, uh, so that was textile industries with the area for which Kerala was known. And the other, of course, is my perennial favorite. I mean, well before the Portuguese came to Kerala, about 15 centuries ago, in pre-Christian Rome, uh, the Roman emperor was ruining the fact that so much of Roman silver was flowing out because they had to pay for Kerala pepper. So the fact is that we were world leaders in production. We seem to forget that. And we seem to be we were painting ourselves into a corner by trying to emphasize too much welfare. Welfare is absolutely important. Any civilized society must have it, but you cannot have a society or an economy which predominantly sees itself in terms of the welfare that it provides, very often by borrowing from future generations. So that is a general point that I want to also make to Vice Admiral Murli Dharan, who uh, uh, raised this very important question. You're absolutely right. Kel Kelton was not just the, well, Kelton was a pioneer and very few people know that the Trivandrum Software Park is the first software park in India. Will anybody believe it? Uh, <laughs> and Malayalis, you know, two out of the four founders of Infosys are from Kerala. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure we have done enough to actually woo these people back. Uh, the governments in Kerala a little arrogant in their treatment of industry. Uh, so, I, I, and I think basically we must come back to seeing production as important, not just from the point of view of employment, but also from the point of view of what makes us uh, a flourishing people. Final question, Dr. Thomas, I know I'm, I'm over time possibly, to, to Arun, uh, the question about uh, the silver line, I've written about it extensively, Arun, you just have to go, I wouldn't say extensively, I've written a couple of articles. Uh, you just have to go on the net and type in my name and type silver line. But I just want to say my objection to the silver line is not on financial grounds about the fiscal deficit, but the fact that it is, in my view, it will actually heighten the ecological insecurity of uh, Kerala without adding at all, and that's a point that I made here, without adding at all, it seems to me, to increasing the competitiveness of production in Kerala. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas. I've taken more time than I should have, but I feel that I need to answer all the questions. Thank you. Bernali, would you like to have the last word? <laughs> um, so I think um, it just, uh, there was something I just wanted to say that it's, it's, it's the, we, Canada actually had a first mover's advantage. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> the point is that we, but what happens after the first mover's advantage? You have to then, you can't, things cannot be static. It has to be dynamic in nature. And I think that's where <clears throat> Canada needs to think through is what are the factors that need to change to be the make the economy more dynamic and adaptive as times change or as other countries, other other states maybe copy Canada and do a much, much better job about it. I think that's where the challenge is. I, and and I slightly, again, you know, the Kerala, the Kerala agriculture um, work, um, we keep on referring back to it about how low productivity is, and it's something we also heard a lot of comments from a lot of stakeholders when we were doing the work. 
And uh, <clears throat> I happen to be again doing some work on farmers mechanization. And you know, while the land is a very emotive issue for us and we get caught up in it. And but when I just looked at this, uh, this is based on Indian MOSPI survey data. And we I found that um, the, how many farmers own, you know, farming equipment. And Kerala is one of the lowest in the country. It is the lowest in the country. This is just, this is not my data. This is all India data based on a survey of a national survey. So it's, it's clearly, it's, you know, the, um, maybe it's a type of crops that they're producing, horticulture crops don't lend to mechanization, but uh, uh, I don't want to spend too much time. The idea is um, while we want to produce organic crops and that adds a value and brand value and uh, get some uh, market value, uh, there's a market value premium to organic products and uh, local products, uh, branded products, that's uh, very nice. But I think at the end of the day, and I'm just using the example of Kerala, that it's not just about land, it's also about, again, what uh, what can we do to you know, upgrade the quality or up uh, use better technology to le leverage better technology to actually improve the productivity, whether it's in agriculture or industry or services. Um, yeah, how can we, how, what are the, what can we do to improve the productivity and the quality of the products so that uh, Kerala, uh, so that Kerala is producing some of the best in India, and not only in India but also the world. I think that's where we, um, that's that that's uh, the that's the critical way to think about it. And uh, we, again, we go back to is what are com Kerala's comparative advantages, and we need to leverage them. Um, uh, that again, the comparative advantages may have changed since 11, 12, and that's fine. But let's identify them and work on them. And let's do an anticipation of what the what potential changes can come over the next 15 years and then work on them accordingly to take the state forward um, in, a, in a sustainable, green, sustainable fashion. I think that's that's what we need to think about that. And any economy needs to be adaptive in nature, and a dynamic and adaptive nature, saying that uh, it's resting on our laurels is not an option anymore. On that note, thank you and a very good evening. Okay. That, that's a very nice note to end the session today. Uh, just take the opportunity to thank Dr. Balakrishnan, Dr. Pandari, and the organizers of this great event, uh, and wish everybody who was here participating all the best in all that you're doing. Thank you for your interest, and all good wishes to everyone. Um, thank you very much.